it's my great pleasure to introduce a successful entrepreneur who wants to help others. Hank Rogers has started one of the first venture accelerators in Hawaii. Rogers and his team help budding entrepreneurs incubate viable businesses ready for angel and venture capital funding. In 2005, the idea for Blue Planet Foundation was born as Rogers was determined to end the use of carbon-based fuel on the planet, starting with fossil fuels in Hawaii, his adopted home. Today, the foundation has become the frontline organization in the fight for renewable energy in Hawaii. Additionally, Rogers leads a research group working on off-grid solutions and exploring the hydrogen economy. Using proprietary microgrid management software, they utilize the latest battery storage technology to store renewable energy. A noted computer game designer and entrepreneur, Rogers is a true global citizen. He was born in Holland, attended New York City's specialized school for mathematics, science and technology, the Stuyvesant High School, went on to study computer science at University of Hawaii, has worked in Japan, and now calls Hawaii home. Early in his career, Rogers produced Japan's first major role-playing video game, The Black Onyx, and he is known for securing the rights for the blockbuster game, Tetris. 30 years after Tetris launch, it continues to be one of the world's most recognizable and top-selling games. We're also joined this evening by Akemi Rogers, Hank's wife. She is the co-founder of Blue Lava Technologies and the owner of Fish Cake. Akemi's deep concern for our planet has led her to serve also on the Blue Planet Foundation board. Hank and Akemi Rogers' record of professional accomplishments is commendable. The commitment they have to our community and its future and to the betterment of this community is clear. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming your commencement speaker, Hank Rogers. What a great day it is to graduate. Not that I would know, because I never actually graduated myself. I... But I imagine it's one of the most exciting mo moments, not only for you amazing students, but for also for your families, your friends, and the faculty that brought you here to celebrate your accomplishment. I am truly honored to be speaking here today. This day belongs to you sitting here before me. But I'd like to tell you a little bit about my life and how I got to where I am today. My hope is that someday each of you will have a story like mine to tell. Yes, I was born in Holland and I attended Stuyvesant High School in New York, moved to Hawaii, spent a year surfing and diving before attending University of Hawaii. There I majored in computer science and I minored in Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, I can see somebody knows what that is. Lesson number one, do what interests you. And if anyone ever tells you that what you are into is a total waste of time, you're probably onto something and they're probably not. <laughs> After three years of going to UH, I dropped out and I chased a girl to Japan, that one. <laughs> that girl is now my wonderful wife of 37 years. So lesson number two, it's okay to follow your passions, even if they stray you from your educational or your career paths. <laughs> I sometimes wondered what would have become of me had I finished my college education. Maybe I could have become something. And I... <laughs> In 1983, at the age of 29, I, I decided to follow my own dream. I got a hold of a personal computer, and I did make the first role-playing game in Japan. It was a totally insane project. I had no idea what I was getting into. My first order from SoftBank was 600 units. People in Japan just didn't know what a role-playing game was. 
So I went to every computer game magazine in Japan and taught them role-playing games. That year, Black Onyx became the number one video game in Japan. Lesson number three, things don't always go the way you think they will. Make them work anyway. I soon realized that I could not be a computer programmer for the rest of my life. So I decided to focus on the publishing of games and travel around the world and bring games to Japan. While at the Consumer Electronics Trade Show in Las Vegas, and this is how I got involved with Tetris, I stumbled upon a little simple game called Tetris. I played it and I was hooked. There was something special about the game. A year later, I found myself on a plane going to Moscow on a tourist visa, attempting to license Tetris from the Soviet Union. To put it in perspective, today that would be like going to North Korea and getting the IP rights of some kind. <laughs> Communists don't believe in IP. Fortunately, I did manage to get the deal and I returned home in one piece, not in, I didn't end up in a gulag. Lesson number four, if you think something is worth it, be ready to take some risks. I ended up getting the handheld rights to Tetris from Elorg and I licensed them to Nintendo. In 1989, Tetris on Game Boy launched and Nintendo sold 38 million copies. ka -ching. A few years later, I helped the uh, Tetris creator, Alexei Pajitnov, and his family escape to the United States. The two of us run the Tetris company today, which licensed to some of the biggest publishers in the industry. Nintendo, Sega, Electronic Arts, Ubisoft, just to name a few. To date, Tetris has sold over 70 million copies as a box product, and over 500 million copies paid mobile downloads and that's not even um, c c counting freemium games, which are free to play games on mobile phones. Another catching. So, a little bit of history. Ten years ago, before the whole world was in, uh, immersed in uh, computer games or mobile game apps, I saw a huge potential, a huge hole in the industry. In Japan, games had already started to come out for mobile, ga for mobile phones, but in this country, they had not. So I again took a risk, and uh, my wife and I sold our home in Kailua that we had worked so hard to, uh, to buy, um, and we started Blue Lava Wireless. 50 mostly students from Hawaii, and myself, and one producer from the mainland, uh, made that company, and three years into it, I was able to sell that company, and that transaction brought me more money than I ever dreamed of. A month after the sale, I found myself in an ambulance with a major heart attack. Lesson number five, money can be great, but it doesn't necessarily make life easier. On the way to the hospital, I told myself that I still had stuff to do, and so I wasn't ready to die. But what was stuff? I had enough money. My children were all adults, wonderful adults. I already made my mark in business. So what, what else could I accomplish? And I worked it out backwards. I figured out, what do I need to accomplish before I actually go? And it's that stuff that I'm here to talk to you about today. My life missions. But first, I want you to ask yourself, what in life is so important that it's worth living for? It took me 52 years and 100% blockage of the largest artery in my heart to figure this one out. So here are my missions. One is to end the use of carbon-based fuel. This one is obvious. Number two is to end war. This one's hard when all of our kids are playing Counter-Strike. Number three is to make a backup of, of life on Earth. This, in, this one's actually easy, except for the why and for the money. Number four 
is to figure out how the universe ends and do something about it. And this one's hard because no one seems to have any answers here. So I would like to talk to you today about missions number one and number three, the obvious and the easy. I'm sure you are aware that we humans are in the process of creating a climate crisis of biblical proportions. Scientists say that we'll lose most of the coral by 2050 and all of the coral by 2100. And this is because of carbon dioxide being absorbed into the ocean. Take Hawaii. We have the highest energy prices and the most availability of alternative energy in the country. We import five billion dollars of oil per year. Maybe it's a little less this year. A third of that becomes jet fuel. Another third goes to ground transportation and the rest goes to making electricity. Ninety something percent of the oil that we import makes electricity. How dumb is that? And all of the oil becomes carbon dioxide, which goes into our atmosphere. It's the reason that we cannot grow, affordably grow food here. It's what makes the cost of living so high. And it's why our jobs in Hawaii pay less than those on the mainland. You might, might be wondering, what does all of this have to do with each of you? Well, ladies and gentlemen, you happen to live in a time when the future of our planet hangs in the balance. You have each been handed a challenge to make important changes before we damage this planet before beyond recognition. So what are these change changes? Technology? political will, communication. We have to change the way we live. And each of you is capable of doing this. We can show the rest of the world that it's possible to live sustainably. We can live without, within our means. We can grow what we eat. And we can live without fossil fuels. We can even live without biofuel. Essentially, we will live sustainably or we won't live at all. Our biggest challenge is the, to find an answer to jet fuel. Many say it's off the table just because it's so hard to replace jet fuel, and it is. We put a ridiculous amount of carbon dioxide in the upper, upper atmosphere, the very worst place, the very worst place where we could put carbon dioxide. That's where the greenhouse gas happened. Transportation. Fortunately, transportation is somewhat less of a challenge. We already have solutions. For instance, we can ride bicycles. We can build cities that are more bicycle friendly or walking friendly. We already have electric cars. And we can enable electric cars by clean energy and incentivize them like Norway where a Tesla costs the same prices as a Lexus. Even hydrogen cars are just a few years away. We can make hydrogen from hydropower, wind, solar, or geothermal. We can even get hydrogen from municipal waste, which cur currently vents it into the atmosphere in the form of methane. Electricity is the easiest challenge. Plenty of places in the world have already stopped using carbon-based fuel for electricity. Iceland uses geothermal. Denmark uses wind, Bhutan uses hydro, Tokelau, yes, Tokelau uses solar. It's been done, folks, and we can do it too. What's stopping us is the lack of political will to make such a leap, along with a select few who make enormous amounts of money keeping, us, keeping the things the way they are. But we can stop them. We created the Blue Plan Planet Foundation, working, to the end, working for the end of carbon-based fuel, starting with Hawaii. This is, this is something that we cannot do alone. There's an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go, to fa go far, go together. And we must go so very far. 
So why would this pending disaster we have here on Earth, why waste time, energy, time and energy doing anything else? Why go to space, for example? Well, the most amazing thing that ever happened on this planet is life. And whether you believe it's caused by spontaneous generation or panspermia or divine intervention, it is still the most amazing thing that ever happened on this planet. There are a hundred billion galaxies in the visible universe, and we have a hundred billion stars in our own galaxy. And we now think that most of these stars have planets. Yet, as far as we know, we are the only planet that has life. If we were to bring life to another planet, it, that would be the most amazing thing that ever happened to that planet. And it would be the most profound accomplishment of our species. If we did nothing else but that, bringing life to another planet, that would be enough to justify our existence. People always ask, why are we here? So while it's important to, that we preserve Earth, it's also important that we explore space. We have to go back to the moon. We have to go to Mars and terraform it and colonize it. We have to go to other star systems and find inhabitable planets. These things may sound far-fetched, but in the scope of things, they are not. If we, the most powerful mili military force in the history of mankind, would forego one West weapon system, for example, the F-53 or F-35, we would save $396 billion. That's one set of planes, $396 billion. NASA's budget for 2015 is $56 billion. I would say that our nations, our great nation's priorities are just a little bit off. Additional benefits to space exploration, terraforming, and colonization would be learning to sustain life in biospheres, learning how to terraform planets to make them more like Earth, and creating backups of the most precious thing in the universe, life. Now I look out at this group and I see much life and I'm filled with hope. You're all young, intelligent, and ready to take on the world. It's the beginning of a new chapter for your lives and only you can decide what comes next. Some of you will help solve energy problems or create life throughout the universe, and some of you might not, but no matter what you choose to do next, you will undoubtedly have an impact on the future of the human race. You have unlimited potential, and I encourage each and every one of you to take the opportunity to do something significant for this planet. Be amazing, make history, and while you're at it, don't forget to have some fun. Aloha and congratulations, class of 2014. Thank you for the generosity of spirit and passion for the mission of Hawaii Pacific University and the life of Hawaii, and for providing such inspirational remarks for our graduates as they begin a new chapter in their lives. At this time, I would like to invite Akemi Rogers to join us on stage. Forty-one years ago, HBU began a tradition in presenting the first Fellow of the Pacific Award. Presented at commencement, the award has been conferred upon 83 individuals since 1973, honoring outstanding community leaders for contributions to Hawaii, the Pacific Rim, and the university. Recipients have included business leaders, 
philanthropists, military officials, elected leaders, and other noted professionals. Whether advocating for clean, renewable energy, mentoring budding entrepreneurs, or developing technological innovations, Hank and Akemi Rogers, you have inspired your community. In recognition of your unselfish and unwavering commitment to the community and the ideals of higher education, it is my privilege to confer upon each of you separately and equally the distinction of Fellow of the Pacific. On behalf of the faculty and students of Hawaii Pacific University, congratulations, Hank and Akemi Rogers. We salute you as leaders of vision and dedication.